Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie McGrath, senior editor at Forbes. On Friday, a 7.7 magnitude earthquake hit central Myanmar, killing at least 1,600 people and likely more, and shaking buildings as far as Bangkok in the neighboring country of Thailand. Joining us to discuss the cause of this earthquake and whether something similar could happen here in the United States is Dr. Lucy Jones. She's a seismologist whose research has really improved the way we predict and also protect ourselves from earthquakes. Dr. Jones, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So let's let's zoom out. You've been studying earthquakes your entire career. Where does this 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake in Myanmar rank relative to the earthquakes we've seen in recent years? Well, it depends on what ranking criteria we use. In terms of societal impact, it's going to be one of the very highest. Right? We have magnitude that tells us how much energy is released by a fault. But how much energy gets to people depends on where the fault is with respect to our cities. And this was a very large earthquake, magnitude 7.7. .7. The fault was probably around 400 kilometers long. So, and that means every point on that 400 kilometers giving off energy. And it was located directly under the major cities of, of Myanmar. So that Mandalay, the second largest city, is directly on top of the fault and right where the episode where it began. Um, but going farther south to the city like that used to be known as Rangoon, that's not far from the end of the fault. I haven't heard anything about what the damage was likely to have been there. Um, and so you and we presumably don't have very good building codes and you know this the, making a seismic resistant building takes some forethought. You're just building a building, you want it to not fall down. You resist gravity. But in an earthquake, the forces push sideways. And if you haven't built to resist that, they come down very easily. And we're pretty sure that's the situation in Myanmar. It's still early days. I saw one economic damage estimate that was north of $60 billion, and some are saying the total damages could be more than the GDP of Myanmar as a whole. And Dr. Jones, you were saying there's reason to believe that the death toll could be almost 10 times that which I stated at the beginning of this conversation. And, and maybe and maybe even 100 times. So the US Geological Survey has developed a program where they take the uh, information about epicenter magnitude and fault and from that estimate what the shaking has been around the region and then compare that to where people are and to the type of construction and it's proved a pretty reliable estimate of of where you've really got the significant issues and they have a greater a 68 percent probability that the fatalities exceed 10,000 and a one in three pr probability that they are exceeding a hundred thousand that's the sort of uncertainty since we, we don't know exactly what the buildings were. The estimated economic losses, um, the most likely uh, is somewhere between uh, 10 billion and 100 billion. Um, and that would, I think, exceed the um, GDP of, of, of Myanmar. Now, when we talk about what causes earthquakes, is what caused this one any different than what causes every other one? Or are all earthquakes caused by the same thing? Okay, well, all earthquakes, uh, well, all earthquakes that aren't on volcanoes uh, respond to stresses in the earth that are pushing the rocks around. And at some point you exceed, you're able to overcome the frictional resistance and, and start moving down a fault. So the earthquakes happen on a fault surface, not at a point. And every point on the surface is giving off energy. What we do see is that um, those stresses are more likely when we're at what's called a plate boundary. There's big pieces of the Earth's crust that are relatively intact and move with respect to others. So Myanmar, this fault is the boundary between the Indian and the Asian plates. Here in California, we have a sim very similar looking fault, the San Andreas Fault. It's the boundary between the Pacific and the North American plates. And this, we see a, a sort of we understand what those type of plate boundary, what we call transform faults or strike slip faults look like. It's a vertical fault. Uh, it's relatively narrow into the earth. You go, you don't have to go very far down before it gets too hot to have that, but you can be very, very long. So this earthquake, it's, you know, 7.7. .7. We're still trying to, to get the fault length, but it's probably around 400 kilometers long, or about 250 miles. This is very similar 
to what we saw in 1906 in San Francisco. Again, the same type of transform fault at the plate boundary, magnitude 7.7, 7, 440 kilometers length. So, um, but when 1906 happened, it was before we had building codes, but also before we had too many people. So we talk about it as the San Francisco earthquake because that was one of the few places that still had people. But in fact, it ruptured the whole way from Cape Mendocino in the north down to um, uh, San Juan Batista is the small town or the, down, down in the north end of the Central Valley. So it was, if it would happen now, we would have many, many more people on top of that fault, but we would also have better buildings. And mm. at least in California, we have building codes that say you shouldn't kill somebody with your, your building. It's okay if it's a total loss. That's your choice to make. Yeah, it's your own economic decision. Just make sure you can't kill people. So what we think of as seismic resistant codes are not about giving us a usable building. They're about giving us a building that doesn't collapse on people. Probably. Try hard. Right? We accept a few percent of our new buildings would collapse in the worst earthquakes. So now imagine if we had a collapse like what we saw in, in Bangkok in San Francisco or in downtown Los Angeles. And actually that's what our building code is aiming for, not to have more than one or two of those. But it's not to get rid of them all. I was going to end the conversation by asking about the likelihood of this happening uh, in California, but since we're on the topic, how predictable are these earthquakes? And were we able to predict this that happened in Myanmar? It depends on what you mean by predict. We are absolutely certain that an earthquake very similar to this will happen in Northern California and another one in Southern California, because we have those faults there. They have to move the basic plate tectonics. When they move is the part we can't predict. So they average about 100 to 150 years between earthquakes. It's been over 300 years since the last one in Southern California. But obviously then there's a lot of variability in the timing on which they happen. But at some point it's absolutely certain to occur. We will not see as much damage as we're seeing in Myanmar because we have better building codes. But we do not uh, require our buildings to not fall down. We expect a few percent of our new buildings to collapse in the strongest shaking. That's the way our code works. And our older buildings are certain to be having significant problems. So what you just said about predictability then, if we apply that to what happened in Myanmar, was there, how much warning did people have? Was oh. it like, is there an initial rumble or were people taken totally by surprise? Uh, they were taken totally by surprise. We can see that if you have a lot of instruments, which we do here in California or Japan, or uh, you can see that the earthquake has begun and potentially get that message to somebody before the waves themselves get to them. Because you can, we can communicate at the speed of light and the waves travel at the speed of sound. So we might get a few seconds here. But you need a modern system, and, and they don't have that in Myanmar. Uh, the one other thing is if the earthquake starts far away from you and is coming towards you, there is an initial wave that's not as big, and therefore it's called the P wave, which really is just primary, the first wave. And then there's a second wave, the S wave, that has is bigger. So you might feel the P wave and then experience the S wave, but it has to start far away from you. And in the case of Mandalay, the beginning of this rupture was actually, the epicenter was, was practically under the city of Mandalay. So they would have, it would have just been sudden. There would have been no uh, warning at all. They could have set it up in Bangkok, but I don't believe that they did because they haven't seen it as being a big issue for them. Because Bangkok is so relatively far from those fault lines? Yeah, one thing that's really surprising is the end of the rupture. So the closest approach of this earthquake to Bangkok is almost 600 kilometers. And then they still collapsed a building. Now, it was still under construction, so maybe they didn't have everything in there. Um, I am sure in the, in the Bangkok that the uh, code would require more strength to withstand wind. The wind forces would be a bigger issue than seismic forces. But presumably there's a building code for wind forces. <laughs> and and I, I'm still quite shocked that a building would fall down that far away. Mm. Um, I think it's something we need to look at here in California. Because part of the reason is the by the time the motion gets that far away, it's a very slow motion. It's very long period. And for a small building then, it's just gonna ride on top of it like a little boat on top of 
big, slow waves. But a really big, tall building will respond. It has a resonant frequency. And just like a, you know, a bow or something, it'll start resonating with, res with that frequency. And that might be part of what happened there was amplification of these really long period waves that strongly affected the really tall buildings. And that's an issue we could get here in California, especially here in Los Angeles. We're sitting in a basin and we get that type of amplification um, because the soil is relatively soft. Now, when you talk about building codes, obviously in the U.S. we have all sorts of regulations and rules that construction workers and manufacturers must follow. If Mandalay is sitting right on top of a fault, I wonder why, why will the destruction be so bad? Why aren't there better codes in place there? Is that something we can answer? I think that's, that's a political question. Right. And it's a country that's been in civil war for so long. Uh, and it's one thing to say we have a code. It's another thing to enforce it. And even here in California, it's it's clearly an issue that there have been corruption cases. Um, there's you know, what did the inspector actually see uh, when we have continuous inspection, which is what happens with our public schools. We get better performance than we do in regular buildings. So having a code doesn't get you anything. You have to enforce them. And what you said about code here in the United States is that it still allows for some buildings to fall. So what are you advocating for change in the law or what needs to happen? Here in California, there's a movement by the engineers and other professionals to try and increase our, our building code from life safety only to what we call functional recovery which means you can recover the function of the building. It's repairable. The estimates are that at most it'll add about 1% to the cost of construction and will uh, save us $4 for every dollar extra we spend in that extra construction. So it's cost effective. It's a really big deal about viability of our societies, but we, we haven't had a big earthquake in long enough that it's hard to get the emotional impact of getting it done. I wonder, I, obviously wildfires are different than earthquakes, but if the disasters from earlier this year, if that would move the needle at all, or even even that wouldn't. I, I think it will, at least here in Southern California. I mean, I live in Pasadena. I'm two miles from the burn zone. So uh, we feel it so very, very directly and see what it's doing to our community. And building codes affect your fire risk too. And one of the problems we had is that most of the homes in the area that burned were pre-1975. And the 2008 building code uh, is incredible about fire safety. And it's, it's thought that if you know, buildings had built, built to that standard, we would have had much, much less damage. And then you have less, you know, it's, the whole thing propagates with fires. So I, I'm hoping that we can get a new discussion about disasters. Earthquakes mm. are just one of them, right? The meteorologic disasters, the fires and the hurricanes are, are increasing because of climate change. So our current approach to disasters is, oh, who could have thought, oh, let's throw all this money at recovery, isn't gonna work when the disasters come too often. And we know it is so much more cost effective to prevent losses rather than respond. Uh, big picture and estimates, $8 saved for every, it costs $8 more to do it as response than as prevention. And um, uh, as the disasters become more, more common, we're going to have to take that into account. We can't afford to go through recovery like this again and again and again. And I think we're seeing it in Los Angeles right now. Will that message carry to everyone else? You may not have our wildfire risk, though much of the West does. But there's hurricanes and there's floods. Look at North Carolina. I mean, we're all facing an increased risk and we could be much more cost effective in how we manage them if we look towards prevention instead of response. We're all facing increased risk and that's across all sorts of natural disasters. But I have to ask, when it comes to earthquakes, as you look at the United States, is it really just the West Coast that's at risk, or are there any fault lines that cross under those of us in the East or Midwest or South? Uh, right, we have a greater risk in the West, um, but you know, the USGS and FEMA a couple decades ago 
took everything we knew about all our faults, looked at what was likely to happen, and came up with the estimated annualized expected losses from earthquakes. And uh, Los Angeles, Southern California is number one because we have 20 million people and 200 faults. San Francisco is number two. Seattle's number three. But number four is New York. And there's so many people with such bad buildings. And yes, there are faults. New England has a, um, it's a much lower level than California, but it has magnitude fives, magnitude sixes uh, every century or so. Right? There was just that 5.7 down in Virginia. Uh, and that was in one of the USGS hotspots for the region. And in the Midwest, there's the really big system, uh, it's called New Madrid Seismic Zone, that produced magnitude sevens in 1811, 1812. So we know that we have quite a high risk there. There's very few states in the United States that uh, do not have a significant earthquake risk. Um, and the ones that used to be really low, some of them are adding it because of uh, oil exploration and fracking has increased the seismic risk in places like Texas and Colorado. Uh, and North, North Dakota used to never have any earthquakes at all. Probably Florida is the only place without earthquakes and it gets hurricanes. Well, that's terrifying. So as an individual who lives in a building built in 1920 in New York City, I have to ask, is there anything individual people can do to protect themselves against an earthquake? I know you've developed some drills, or is it really just lobbying our elected officials and hoping that codes continue to improve upon the in existing infrastructure? Well, it, codes should continue to improve getting retrofitting of buildings is very very effective now here in california it's been considered worthwhile to require these it's a local jurisdictional issue but many communities of southern cal both bay area and southern california are requiring retrofit of some of the known worst buildings but as an individual you can always ask for a foundation specialist to come in and look at your building and see what you could do to be be stronger and i've done it every time i bought a house in california i would do it buying a house anywhere um, and then there's also uh, being ready to respond. And so the drills are really about, if you haven't done anything else, what are you gonna do when things come apart? And probably the biggest issue actually we see is communication. I mean, what are you gonna do if your cell phone doesn't work and you don't know where your kids are? And that's probably the situation right after an earthquake. And, and you know, we aren't used to not being in, in contact. So having family communication plans is huge. And we also discover that when people go through the process of creating that, then they start thinking about some of the other things. Um, and the other part I'd say, I, I sometimes tell people, they ask me about getting an earthquake kit, you know, a go bag or whatever. And I'll end up saying, forget the kit, talk to your neighbors. Because mm. the communities that recover from disasters are ones that have a high level of what the social scientists call social capital, where people are connected to each other and there to help. And so one of the big programs we're undertaking here in Southern California right now is trying to develop more community resilience, have resilience hubs, have processes by which people talk to each other and help each other and plan together, because that's going to be the thing that really gets us through it. And it's what we're seeing, I'd say here, the, the, you know, there were two big fires in Los Angeles. I'm near the Eaton Fire and the east side of town. The degree of the community coming together and helping each other has been really encouraging. I would have said Californians don't do neighborhood very well, right? We drive past everybody else. In fact, we are doing neighborhood really well, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, and I think it's going to help us come back. Well, that is a note of optimism to end on. Dr. Lucy Jones, seismologist, thank you so much for coming on and explaining all of this to us. We really appreciate your insight. Well, thank you for having me. Enjoyed it.